Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today I am going to talk about the thyroid gland. Once a patient came to a doctor telling that people noticed a swelling in the front of the neck and he was worried. Why is this swelling? The doctor when he was checking him for the swelling asked him to swallow. The patient swallowed and the doctor told most probably this is a, a swelling in the thyroid gland. The patient asked him, I have heard that thyroid gland is a gland which is going to secrete the thyroxin, but how does it help in helping me to swallow? Why did you check for swallowing to see whether this is thyroid gland. The doctor told him that its relation to various structures in the neck helps for thyroid gland to move when there is a swelling in it. So let us look at the normal anatomy of thyroid gland. We will be covering this topic under these headings, a line of introduction. What are the functions of thyroid gland? Where is it situated? What are its gross features? What are its covering? What are the structures related to it? The blood supply to the gland, the various nerves supplying it, lymphatic drainage, how does it develop and ultimately the applied aspects related to the thyroid gland and will end up by summarizing the topic. Thyroid or thyros means shield like. This gland is present in front of the neck in the form of a shield, hence it is called as thyroid. You find this gland to be an unique endocrine gland. What is the uniqueness of this endocrine gland is it does not form the various hormones and secrete them immediately into the bloodstream. But what does it do? It f manufactures the various hormones, it stores these hormones and it is going to release this into the bloodstream as and when there is requirement for these hormones. That is the uniqueness of this endocrine gland. This is one of the largest endocrine glands. It also depends on external environment for its raw material that is the iodine because its secretions are iodinated compounds they are actually triiodothyronine and tetraiodothyronine the T3 and T4 hormones which we have heard of. So you need iodine as raw material which has to come from the external environment. This is one of the glands with the richest blood supply which is almost comparable to the blood supply of kidney and the adrenal gland. Let us look at the functions of thyroid gland. Thyroid gland helps in maintaining the basal metabolic rate. It helps in the psychosomatic growth of the body. And it also takes part in calcium metabolism. It is going to help in maintaining the blood calcium level. How? Because it is going to decrease the blood calcium level. It is not going to allow the body to uptake calcium or it is not going to help in retaining or reabsorbing calcium in the renal tubules. Now let us look at the position of the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is situated in front of the neck 
when you look at the vertebral level, it extends from the fifth cervical vertebra to the first thoracic vertebra that is opposite C5, C6, C7 and T1. This extent is for the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland and where is this lateral lobe? This is the lateral lobe and the extent is from the C5 vertebra to T1 vertebra, the lateral lobe. Whereas the communication between the two lateral lobes which is called as the isthmus, this will extend from the second tracheal ring to the fourth tracheal ring. So, you find this thyroid gland is almost like a butterfly shaped gland here or in the shape of the letter H with two lateral lobes connected by an isthmus. So, lateral lobe extent is C5 to T1 whereas isthmus extent is the tracheal rings second to fourth. When you look at the lateral lobe, you find that it can be explained in relation to the cartilages in the larynx also. So, it is related or the upper end of this is related to the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage. This upper end is the apex of the lateral lobe which is at the level of oblique line of the thyroid cartilage. Whereas, the lower end which is called as the base of the lateral lobe, this will be in relation to the tracheal rings either the fourth or the fifth tracheal ring. This is the base of the lateral lobe. So, the extent is from the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage to the fourth or the fifth tracheal rings. That is the extent of lateral lobe. So, now we know thyroid gland which is present in front of the neck in relation to the larynx and the trachea is butterfly shaped or in the form of the letter H with two lateral lobes connected in the midline by a narrow band which is called as isthmus. Now, you find this lateral lobe has an apex, a base and it has three surfaces. A surface which is visible on the outer aspect that is the superficial surface or the lateral surface. The surface which is towards the larynx and the pharynx is the medial surface and a surface which is behind that will be the posterior lateral surface. You find two borders separating these two surfaces, an anterior border which is between the medial surface and the superficial surface, a posterior border which is between the superficial surface and the posterior surface. The medial surface and the posterior surface are not demarcated well. So, each lateral lobe has an apex, a base, a superficial surface, a medial surface and a posterior lateral surface, three surfaces and two borders, an anterior border and a posterior border. Whereas, the isthmus which is connecting the two lobes has an anterior surface and a posterior surface an upper border and a lower border. It is a flat band which measures about 1.25 centimeters in length and width. A flat band of tissue measuring 1.25 centimeters in length and width that is the isthmus of the thyroid gland. Whereas, the lateral lobe measures about 5 centimeters in length that is the from the apex to the base, it measures about 5 centimeters. The width is about 3 centimeters and the thickness is about 2 centimeters. That is the measurements of the lateral lobe. Occasionally, you find an extra lobe extending from the upper border of the isthmus. This extra lobe is called as pyramidal lobe because of its shape. It is a remnant of lower end of the thyroglossal duct which is seen during development of the thyroid gland that is the pyramidal lobe. Occasionally you also find a fibrous band connecting the upper border of the isthmus that is the upper border of the isthmus being connected to the bone which is present on the anterior surface of the neck and that is the fibrous band 
levator glandulae thyroidae, levator glandulae thyroidae, this is the levator glandulae thyroidae and this is a fibrous band connecting the upper end of the isthmus to the hyoid bone which is present at the junction of the floor of the mouth and the anterior surface of the neck. Let us look at the coverings of the thyroid gland. The gland is enclosed in the layer of deep cervical fascia which is called as pretracheal fascia. This pretracheal fascial layer will form a false capsule for the gland. So, this is the false capsule for the gland that is for that is the pretracheal fascia forming the false capsule. You also find the thickening of the stroma of the gland itself forming a true capsule for the gland. So, this is the true capsule surrounding the gland intimately and this is the false capsule. And what do you find between these two capsules? You find the trunk of the blood vessels lying between the two capsules and you also find the parathyroid glands lying between the false and the true capsule of the gland. When you look at the capsule, this is the false capsule and this is the, the greener one is the true capsule here. This is the thyroid gland. Between the true capsule and the gland, actual stroma of the gland, you find a venous plexus present in case of thyroid gland, this is in contrast to what you have seen in prostate gland. In prostate gland, you find a venous plexus between the false capsule and the true capsule. True capsule is adherent to the glandular tissue and the venous plexus is between the two capsules. Whereas, in thyroid, the venous plexus is deep to the true capsule adjacent to the glandular tissue. Why is this relevant is whenever a surgery is being done to prevent excessive bleeding, you need to remove the thyroid gland with the true capsule. So, you need to remove the gland with the true capsule, the plane of cleavage should be here between the false and true capsule. Whereas, in case of prostate, you remove the gland by leaving behind the true capsule. This is the plane of cleavage because you do not want to disturb this venous plexus. So, in case of prostate, you leave behind both the capsules with the venous plexus in the body, remove only the prostate. Whereas, in case of thyroid, you remove the thyroid along with its true capsule and the venous plexus, leaving behind only the false capsule. So, that is the difference. What you notice due to their coverings and the relation of these coverings to the venous plexus in two of the glands, one is thyroid and the other one is prostate. When you look at the pretracheal fascia, which is going to form the false capsule for the thyroid gland, you see this, it encloses the thyroid gland, runs upwards to get attached on the sides to the oblique line of thyroid cartilage and in the midline, it is going to get attached to the hyoid bone. So, when you trace it upwards, it is going to get attached to two structures here. One is the oblique line of thyroid cartilage and the other one is hyoid bone. When you trace it below, you find that it is thickened between the medial surface of the gland and the cricoid cartilage. So, attaching the false capsule to the cricoid cartilage by a thickening which is called as suspensory ligament of berry, suspensory ligament of berry. All these attachments will tell you what happens when you have uh, the process of deglutition. So, that is when you swallow something because these cartilages will be moving, hyoid bone will be moving, they are going to move the thyroid gland with them. So, what happens is thyroid moves upwards on deglutition. So, this is due to the attachment of the pretracheal fascia to these structures and it is going to form a false capsule to the gland. When you trace the pretracheal fascia, you find it is not uniform all along the thyroid gland. You find the pretracheal fascia forming the false capsule being thinner along its posterior border. 
So, whenever there is enlargement of the thyroid gland, naturally it will enlarge towards the weaker area and that will be the posterior border of the thyroid gland. So, it enlarges more towards the posterior aspect thereby compressing the structures which are present posteriorly. We will be looking at the relations next. When you also trace the false capsule, it will be descending down to reach and blend with the pericardium of the heart. In the superior mediastinum, it will pass and then blend with the fibrous pericardium of the heart. So, any thyroid swelling can descend down into the mediastinum. Now, let us look at the relations of the thyroid gland. As we have already seen, the structure what we have seen is each lobe has got, when you take a section, it will be something like this. You find an anterior border, a posterior border with three surfaces. One is the superficial surface. this is the superficial surface, this surface is the medial surface and this surface will be the posterolateral surface. So, you find three surfaces, a superficial surface, a medial surface and a posterolateral surface separated by two borders, one is the anterior border and the other one is the posterior border. This is not very prominent. So, medial surface and posterior lateral surfaces, they are not separated by a prominent border. So, when you take a section, this is how it is going to appear. Now, we are going to see what are the structures which are present here. So, they will be in relation to the superficial surface. What are the structures which are present here? They will be in relation to the medial surface and the structures here that will be in relation to the posterior lateral surface. We can remember posterior lateral surface being related to the carotid sheath and its contents because that lies as a neurovascular bundle in the neck just behind the thyroid lateral lobe here. So, here will be the carotid sheath and the contents. Here will be the two tubes and structures related to it that is the airway and the foot passage. So, either the pharynx and the esophagus or the larynx and the trachea that will be related to the medial surface. Superficial surface will be covered by strap muscles in the neck deep to the deep fascia and the skin. So, this is in general the relations of the lateral lobe. Now, let us look at the relations here. You can see the picture showing the anterior surface relations here that will be the superficial surface relations, you find the strap muscles. So, the strap muscles which are seen lying anterior to the thyroid gland are one is the sternohyoid and the superior belly of omohyoid which are attached to the hyoid bone. So, they run in a superficial plane, medial is sternohyoid and lateral is omohyoid superior belly. When you remove these two, you find one more deeper muscle which is also a strap muscle. This is the sternothyroid which is present on a deeper plane. So, all these three muscles and also a part of the muscle which is cut here. This muscle which is the cut end here which you see is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So, part of it also covers the lateral loop. So, you find the superficial surface deep to the skin and the pretracheal layer, superficial to it, superficial to the pretracheal layer, you will find the muscles that will be the strap muscles. The superficial ones are the sternohyoid and omohyoid superior belly and deeper to this will be the sternothyroid. Lower part of this is related to the sternocleidomastoid. So, these are the relations to the superficial surface of the gland. Same can be appreciated on the cross section here which is shown at the level of the thyroid gland, a cross section of the neck. When you get oriented to this cross section, you can see this is the thoracic 
vertebra, here is the esophagus, here is the trachea, here is the isthmus of the thyroid gland with the lateral lobes. This is the superficial surface of the lateral lobe and the relations which we spoke about. So, this becomes the sternohyoid, this is the deeper plane that is the sternothyroid, this is the superficial plane laterally omohyoid, superior belly and this is the sternocleidomastoid covering them and here will be the pretracheal layer, pretracheal layer forming the false capsule. Superficial to this will be the skin and the superficial fascia. So, these are the relations of the superficial surface. When you look at this posterior surface or the posterior lateral surface, it is related to this sheath that is the carotid sheath and its contents lying within it. This is the common carotid artery, this is the internal jugular vein and lying between the two in a posterior plane is the vagus nerve. You also find the anterior wall of the carotid sheath in relation to ansa cervicalis. So, all these will form the relations to the posterior lateral surface of the thyroid lateral lobe. Now, this is the medial surface of the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland. You can see these structures here. It is related to two tubes, two muscles and two nerves. Which are the two tubes? It is the larynx continuing as the trachea, pharynx continuing as the esophagus. The tracheoesophageal groove has a nerve here and that is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The other nerve which is closer to the upper end of the lateral lobe is the external laryngeal nerve. Both the nerves are branches of the vagus. You also find two muscles in relation to the medial surface that will be the cricothyroid muscle connecting the cricoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage and the inferior constrictor of the pharynx. So, two muscles cricothyroid inferior constrictor of pharynx, two tubes larynx continuing as trachea, pharynx continuing as esophagus, two nerves recurrent laryngeal nerve and external laryngeal nerve. These are the relations of the medial surface of the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland. <coughs> you can see the two muscles in relation to the lateral lobe medial surface. This is the cricothyroid muscle connecting the cricoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage cricothyroid muscle supplied by external laryngeal nerve. This is the inferior constrictor muscle of the pharynx. So, these two muscles are on the medial side of the lateral lobe. When you look at the borders relations, you find the posterior border is related to the <coughs> two glands which are present that is the superior parathyroid and the inferior parathyroid. As we have already noted, they lie between the true and the false capsule of the thyroid gland. They lie along the posterior border of the thyroid gland between the two capsules. You also find along the posterior border, the anastomosis between the posterior branch of superior thyroid artery and the inferior thyroid artery ascending branch. So, this is the posterior descending branch of superior thyroid, this is the ascending branch of inferior thyroid. They anastomose along the posterior border and this is the parathyroid. Along the anterior border, you will find the anterior descending branch of superior thyroid descending down and reaches the upper border of isthmus where it anastomoses with the fellow of the opposite side. So, that is the anterior descending branch of the superior thyroid along the anterior border of the lateral lobe. Now, let us look at the relations of the isthmus. We have seen isthmus is like a band 1.25 centimeters by 1.25 centimeters, the length and the width with an anterior surface, a posterior surface, superior border and inferior border. When you look at the anterior surface that will be related to the strap muscles that is the sternohyoid and sternothyroid. It is also related to a vein which runs on the anterior surface that is the anterior jugular vein. Posterior surface of the isthmus is related to the second, third and the fourth tracheal rings, second, third and the fourth tracheal rings. 
upper border of the isthmus can have a pyramidal lobe or it can have a fibrous cord connecting it to the hyoid bone that will be called as levator glandular thyroidea which is a fibrous cord connecting the upper border of pyramidal lobe or the isthmus to the hyoid bone that will be the levator glandular thyroidea. Occasionally you can find muscle fibers in this fibrous cord. Along the upper border you also find the anastomosis between the anterior descending branches of the two superior thyroid arteries taking place. Whereas the inferior border which lies anterior to the trachea will have the th inferior thyroid veins leaving it. They will be ending in the left brachiocephalic vein and you find occasionally an artery supplying this region entering the inferior border of the isthmus. This artery can be a branch coming from the brachiocephalic trunk or the arch of aorta. This artery is called as arteria thyroidea ima. It comes towards the lower border of the isthmus. So, these are the structures in relation to the isthmus. Now, let us look at the arterial supply of thyroid gland. As you have already seen, it has got a very rich vascular supply in, which is comparable to that of the kidney or the adrenal gland. So, what are the arteries supplying this gland? You find this artery which is coming from above supplying the upper one third of the lateral lobe and the upper half of the isthmus is a branch coming from the external carotid artery. This is the superior thyroid artery, a ventral branch of external carotid artery. It is the first ventral branch of external carotid descending downwards and forwards accompanied by a nerve, the external laryngeal nerve. As it reaches the apex of the lateral lobe, the artery and the nerve separate. The artery comes towards the apex and runs forwards by dividing into two, an anti and posterior descending branch, whereas the nerve passes deep to the apex. This is an important relation between the artery and the nerve because when this artery has to be ligated or tied so that you can cut the artery when you may be doing thyroidectomy, removal of the thyroid when you have to tie and cut the arteries, you need to know where to ligate the artery. So, superior thyroid artery has to be ligated very close to the gland to avoid injury to external laryngeal nerve. External laryngeal nerve which is going to accompany superior thyroid artery in the upper part is going to go deep to the apex of the lateral lobe. So, near the apex of the lateral lobe, the artery and the nerve are farther apart. So, it is much safer to tie the superior thyroid artery closer to the apex of the thyroid gland. Then once it reaches the apex, the superior thyroid artery is going to divide into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. The anterior descending branch will accompany the anterior border, reach the isthmus superior border and anastomose with the similar branch coming from the opposite side. So, it is going to supply the upper one third of the lateral lobe and upper half of the isthmus. The posterior descending branch will be going backwards to supply the posterior surface. We will have a look at it later. Now, this inferior thyroid artery is the other branch which is coming from the subclavian arterial system. Subclavian artery first part is going to give this branch which is called as thyrocervical trunk. The largest branch coming from here uh, that is the thyrocervical trunk is the inferior thyroid artery. Inferior thyroid artery will loop medially from the thyrocervical trunk, it is going to loop medially behind the carotid arterial system to reach the base of the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland where it is going to terminate by dividing into a multiple number of branches which are going to supply the thyroid gland. One of them will ascend up as the ascending branch to meet the descending branch coming from the 
superior thyroid artery, posterior descending branch of superior thyroid artery along the posterior border, this anastomosis will be taking place. The other branches, multiple branches of inferior thyroid is going to supply the lateral lobe and the isthmus. So, you find lower two thirds of the lateral lobe being supplied by inferior thyroid artery, upper one third by superior thyroid. Whereas, in case of isthmus, it is upper half and lower half. You also find this inferior thyroid artery is very close to a nerve which is going to come towards the thyroid gland from below that is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Recurrent laryngeal nerve and inferior thyroid artery are closer to each other very close to the gland. So, when you have to tie up inferior thyroid artery it should be done away from the gland when it is farther apart from the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The other artery which can occasionally supply the thyroid gland is this branch arising from here. This is the arteria thyroidia ima, an infrequent branch which is going to supply thyroid gland. This if it is present, it is going to be a branch coming from this structure that is the brachiocephalic trunk or it can be a branch coming from the arch of aorta, arteria thyroidia ima a branch which is going to supply the lower part of the thyroid gland. When you look at the posterior border of the thyroid gland, you can see this is the posterior descending branch of superior thyroid artery. This is the loop of inferior thyroid which is going to divide into multiple branches. One of them is going to ascend up to anastomose with the descending branch of superior thyroid. You will find these inferior thyroid branches also supplying the parathyroid here. So, that is the arteries which supply the thyroid gland and the nerves related to it we have mentioned now. You can see this relation here. So, this is the superior thyroid artery, a branch coming from the external carotid artery. What type of branch is it? It is a ventral branch. So, it is the first ventral branch of external carotid. It is accompanied by this nerve. This nerve is the external laryngeal nerve, a branch coming from the superior laryngeal nerve which is in turn a branch of vagus. Now, external laryngeal and superior thyroid are closer to each other, but as they come towards the apex they separate out. External laryngeal nerve is going to go deep to the apex, it will go and supply this muscle here that is the cricothyroid. Whereas, this relation here, this is the inferior thyroid artery loop coming from the thyrocervical trunk. Thyrocervical trunk is in turn a branch of first part of subclavian. This is going to form a loop and it is going to end by dividing into multiple branches which will be related to this nerve which is ascending up in the tracheoesophageal groove and that nerve is the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is also a branch of vagus. Recurrent laryngeal nerve can be superficial or can be deep or can pass between the branches of inferior thyroid artery. It is also in relation to the suspensory ligament of Berry on the medial surface. It can be anterior, posterior or pass through the ligament. So, that is recurrent laryngeal nerve. Because it is related here, posterior aspect of the lateral lobe, whenever there is enlargement of the thyroid gland, thyroid enlargement commonly happens posteriorly because of the false capsule being thinner, compression of this recurrent laryngeal nerve can result in hoarseness of voice. If it compresses the external laryngeal nerve, it results in weakness of voice. Now, let us look at the venous drainage of the thyroid gland. The veins do not accompany the arteries. You find the superior thyroid vein which starts from the apical aspect of the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland. The superior thyroid vein is going to accompany or pass along the medial border of the omohyoid, whereas in middle thyroid vein <coughs> is going to pass along the lateral border of omohyoid. Both these superior and middle thyroid veins will be ending in this vein that is the internal jugular vein. The middle thyroid vein is the widest among these veins. You also find these veins, they are the inferior thyroid veins which are going to leave the lower part of the isthmus 
pass in front of the trachea and end in the left brachiocephalic vein behind the sternum, manubrium sterni. So, left brachiocephalic vein will receive the inferior thyroid veins from the lower part of the isthmus in front of the trachea. These are the three veins which are constantly present draining the thyroid gland. Occasionally you find a stout short vessel which is going to leave the lower part of the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland somewhere here between the middle and the inferior thyroid veins. It is going to end in the internal jugular vein. This has got a very short course. So, when you are trying to mobilize structures here because of its shortness it can get ruptured or torn resulting in bleeding. So, we should be very careful you have to search for this fourth vein which is present here. It is called as fourth thyroid vein of Kocher or Kocher's vein which is present between the middle and the inferior thyroid vein goes and ends again in the internal jugular vein. Now, let us look at the lymphatic drainage of the thyroid gland. You find the thyroid gland upper and medial portion of this will be draining into the prelaryngeal lymph nodes, upper and lateral portion of this will be draining into the upper deep cervical lymph nodes which will also receive efferents from the prelaryngeal. This upper deep cervical lymph nodes are nothing but jugulodigastric group of nodes. The lower and medial part of thyroid is going to drain into the pretracheal lymph nodes whereas lower and lateral part is going to drain into the lower lateral deep cervical lymph nodes. There are also some nodes along the recurrent laryngeal nerve which will also receive the efferents here. So, either pretracheal or prelaryngeal in the medial part and lateral part is the deep cervical upper or lower. Ultimately, all of them will be going to the deep cervical group of lymph nodes. So, it can be divided into four areas. This is the upper medial area going into prelaryngeal. Prelaryngeal will again drain into upper deep cervical. This is the upper lateral area draining directly into upper deep cervical. This is the lower medial area going to pretracheal which is going to end in lower deep cervical. This is the uh, lower lateral area directly into lower deep cervical and also lymph nodes along the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Let us look at the nerve supply of the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland receives both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The parasympathetic supplied via the vagus and its recurrent laryngeal nerve branch we are not sure about their function. So, what do they do with the thyroid gland? Not very well established vagus and recurrent laryngeal. For a sympathetic which is mainly from the middle cervical sympathetic, but fibers arising from others like superior and inferior also are going to supply, but mainly from the middle cervical sympathetic ganglion is going to supply the thyroid gland. So, most of the time this is vasomotor in nature, but now recent studies have also shown that they can have a say in the secretion or manufacture of the thyroxine or the thyroid hormone. That is the sympathetic nerve supply via middle cervical sympathetic ganglion. Let us look at the development of the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland develops from a median endodermal thyroid diverticulum which is descending down from the floor of the pharynx posterior to the tuberculum impar. This endodiver endodermal diverticulum will descend down in front of the neck first through the tongue then below into the front of the neck where it can have a anterior relation inferior relation and posterior relation to the hyoid bone. So, if you look at the hyoid bone section, if the hyoid bone, if you take a section, if it is something like this and this is the anterior surface of the neck, you find the thyroid coming down through the tongue, descending below, reaching suprahyoid portion, then it has a course in front of the hyoid bone then it reaches infrahyoid portion, then it goes slightly behind the hyoid bone 
and then it descends down into the lower part of the front of the neck. Why is this important is if this caudal migration does not take place during development of the thyroid gland, if this caudal migration does not take place, then if there is an arrest, it can be found in these positions also. So, what do you find? You find thyroid can be situated here itself, then it becomes a lingual thyroid, thyroid present in the tongue. It can be present here, then it becomes a suprahyoid thyroid, the thyroid which is above the hyoid bone. It can be in front of the hyoid bone, prehyoid, or it can be infrahyoid, retrohyoid, or it can be below the hyoid bone, above the cricoid cartilage or the rings of the trachea. Occasionally, it can have an excessive migration, then it can descend down into the thorax, then you find a retrosternal thyroid which will be found in the mediastinum. So, this is how development can result in certain anomalies where the position of the thyroid can be varying. So, these type of thyroid tissues present in abnormal position will be called as ectopic thyroid. Now, this endodermal median diverticulum will descend down in front of the hyoid, it will reach below the cricoid cartilage. After this, it forms a luminal structure which is called as thyroglossal duct, the upper end of which will remain as the foramen cecum, which can be appreciated behind the uh, tuberculum impar region in the tongue. That is the junction between anterior two thirds and posterior one third of the tongue. You find the sulcus terminalis, the junction between the two limbs of the sulcus is the foramen cecum. So, below this is the thyroglossal duct. The lower end of the thyroglossal duct will divide, forming a bilobed structure. Further development of this bilobed structure will give rise to the lateral lobes. The junction between the duct and the two lobes will form the isthmus. Now, whatever is present between the isthmus and the foramen cecum will start disappearing. So, most of the thyroglossal duct will disappear. Occasionally, lower portion of this can remain, resulting in pyramidal lobe. So, this endodermal thyroid diverticulum will give rise to the follicular cells of the thyroid gland. Whereas the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, they are neuroendocrine cells belonging to the apud system, amine, amine precursor uptake and decarboxylation. The diffuse apud system cells is parafollicular cells, they are supposed to be neural crest derivatives, they are developing from the ultimobranchial body or the caudal pharyngeal complex. So, from this you find the parafollicular cells developing, they are between the follicles. Parafollicular cells, they have a separate function and what is that function? They are going to secrete thyrocalcitonin, which is going to help maintaining the calcium level. So, that is about the development of the thyroid gland. Now, you can see the anomalies related with the development and its migration, you can see the thyroid gland can be submucosal, it can be intramuscular in the tongue, it can be in the inferior aspect of the tongue above the hyoid bone, it can be here also anterior to hyoid, it can be here also that is the retrohyoid, this is inferior to hyoid or it can descend down to reach the mediastinum, retrosternal thyroid gland. If the duct does not disappear, that is the thyroglossal duct between the foramen cecum, foramen cecum which is uh, present at the junction of anterior two thirds and posterior one third of the tongue, the upper end is remaining as foramen cecum. The duct which is present between the foramen cecum and the pyramidal lobe or the upper border of the isthmus, if it does not get fibrosed completely, if it does not regress, then you can see small pockets of this duct remaining, it, then it can form a cystic swelling along its course. That is a remnant of the 
duct, thyroglossal duct forming a cyst that will be called as thyroglossal cyst. The other applied aspects related to thyroid gland is an enlarged thyroid gland not due to physiological enlargement like menstruation and pregnancy then it will be called as goiter. Goiter can be associated with hyperfunction or hypofunction. When it is hyperfunction, when there is excess secretion, then it is called as thyrotoxicosis. The swelling is the goiter along with thyrotoxicosis due to hyperfunction. Person will have tachycardia, tremors, exophthalmus, person will be very lean due to increased basal metabolic rate. So, these are some of the features of thyrotoxicosis. It can also be associated with hypofunction where there is decrease in the secretion of the thyroid hormones. If it happens in adults, it is called as myxedema. There will be lot of water retention edema, resulting in edema, so it is called as myxedema. In children, it is called as cretinism because it is related with the calcium levels. It is called as cretinism. Enlargement of the thyroid gland due to its size itself, it can result in certain signs and symptoms. Thyroid gland we told you earlier itself that it is going to enlarge posteriorly because you find the fascia being thinner, that is the capsule being thinner posteriorly. So, it is going to enlarge posteriorly when compared to anterior aspect. So, when it enlarges posteriorly, it is going to compress the structures present on the posterior aspect giving rise to these features. Dyspnea is when there is difficulty in breathing due to compression of the larynx or the trachea. Dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing due to compression of the pharynx and the esophagus. Dysphonia, when there is an altered or difficulty in speech and this is due to compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is present deep. So, these are some of the effects of the goiter. We told you a swelling like goiter moves on swallowing because of the attachments of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia that is the pretracheal layer which forms the false capsule. But a swelling does not extend beyond the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage because the apex of the thyroid gland is sandwiched between two muscles attached to the oblique line of thyroid cartilage. The superficial muscle is the sternothyroid, the deeper muscle is the inferior constrictor. So, you find the apex sandwiched between these two muscles. So, you would find thyroid gland enlargement will never go upwards beyond the oblique line whereas, it can descend down into the mediastinum. If it descends down into the mediastinum, it can compress the trachea resulting in severe dyspnea and it also can give rise to mediastinal syndrome. Compression of various veins etc. can take place. A hyperfunction thyroid has to be removed so that the hormone levels will be maintained or if there is a tumor, it has to be removed. Removal of the thyroid is called as thyroidectomy. When thyroid is removed, then as much as possible we need to save the posteriorly placed two structures that is the parathyroid. So, all along the posterior border you leave behind a strip of thyroid gland. You do not do a total thyroidectomy, but you do a subtotal thyroidectomy. And also you have to remember the artery relation to the nerve because we need to ligate the arteries while thy doing thyroidectomy. Superior thyroid artery to be ligated very close to the gland, inferior thyroid artery to be ligated away from the gland. So, that has to be kept in mind because of their close association with the nerves. Whenever there is injury to recurrent laryngeal nerve, it can result in hoarseness of voice. If it is bilateral, it can result in no voice production whereas, external laryngeal nerve which is supplying cricothyroid if it is injured it results in weakness of the voice because cricothyroid is a tensor of the occult cord. Thyroid can also get affected with autoimmune disorder where there is antigen antibody reaction thereby decreasing the secretions of the thyroid gland. One such example is the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So, thyroid gland can get affected by the autoimmune disease where there is decreased secretions of the thyroid gland 
example being Hashimoto's thyroiditis, autoimmune disorder. There will be antigen antibody reaction for the thyroid hormone itself. Now coming to the end of the lecture, we are going to summarize what we spoke about. Thyroid gland is an unique endocrine gland which is going to manufacture, store and release its hormones as and when required by the body. It is present in front of the lower part of the neck. So, any swelling in the midline in the lower part of the neck, you have to rule out thyroid disorder. When enlarged, it forms what is called as goiter which moves with deglutition, one of the features which has to be looked for to rule out thyroid enlargement. It is a highly vascular organ in comparison which can be compared with the kidney and the suprarenal gland. The vessels which are supplying here are accompanied by nerves which has to be kept in mind while doing thyroidectomy and ligation of the arteries whether it should be closer to the gland or away from the gland to save the nerves. The hypofunction or hyperfunction of the thyroid gland where the hormone level is decreased or increased results in production of characteristic features which can be easily identified. So, that should be kept in mind. This specimen shows the pharynx and the larynx continuing down as the trachea and the esophagus, upper part is the pharynx and the larynx continuing down as the esophagus, this is the esophagus and this is the trachea. You find the anterior surface of this is related to this gland which is head shaped or shield like gland or butterfly shaped gland which has got two lobes, this is one lobe, this is the lateral lobe, this is the other lateral lobe and this is the median isthmus connecting the two lobes. The upper border of the isthmus you can see a small projection of the gland which is the pyramidal lobe. The continuation of the pyramidal lobe forms a fibromuscular band connecting it to the hyoid bone crossing the thyroid cartilage. You can see the thyroid cartilage here. You can see the muscles which are related to the lateral lobe. This is the cricothyroid muscle connecting the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage, cricothyroid muscle. This is the oblique line of thyroid cartilage, the muscle which is running posteriorly from here, what you can appreciate here, the posterior fibers running backwards from here is the inferior constrictor of the pharynx. So, you find cricothyroid and inferior constrictor forming medial relation to the lateral lobe of the thyroid. The isthmus lying against the second, third and the fourth tracheal rings, you can see the tracheal rings below it rest of the trachea is seen up to the carina where it is dividing into the two bronchi that can be appreciated. So, this is cricothyroid and this is inferior constrictor of pharynx. Oblique line of thyroid cartilage, the upward extension what you can see here is the thyrohyoid, thyrohyoid. There will be a strap muscle coming and getting attached here. So, between the inferior constrictor and this muscle that is the sternothyroid, the apex of the thyroid gland will be sandwiched. The strap muscle superficial to this is sternothyroid, deeper is inferior constrictor. So, between these two the apex of the thyroid gland will lie. So, upward extension of thyroid gland is not possible. So, that is about the thyroid gland. With this we end the topic on thyroid gland. Thank you.